Thank you, Mia, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Wilhelm van Rensburg, Senior Art uh, Specialist and Head Curator at Strauss and Company. Uh, very welcome to a special exhibition, Social Stances, uh, George Pemba and Robert Hodgins, and also a special word of welcome to two very special experts in their fields, Sarah Huddleston and Neil Dundas, and I'll introduce them uh, in due course. Uh, as Mia indicated, this is uh, it's, it's ongoing. It's the third in a series of special exhibitions. Uh, the first one was in 2019, uh, a meeting of minds where I paid Louis Macubela and Douglas Portway. In uh, uh, 2020, it was Gladys Mugudlandlu and Maggie Lapshirt, uh, Parallel Lives, and this year, Social Stances. George Pemba and Robert Hodgins' social stances, simply because both artists, both Pemba and Hodgins, of course, drew extensively from society, uh, and they took up different attitudes, different stances, if you like, towards that, um, uh, towards that society uh, or the society in which they live, and that was really uh, the, uh, the, the, the approach that I followed here. Um, just to give you an indication of why I always like to pair artists, this was uh, Douglas Portway and Louis Macubella. The two artists actually met in 1967 in Cornwall after Portway, Portway permanently left South Africa and they influenced each other. They uh, were really the meeting of minds, their interests, their philosophical outlook on life, the manner in which they uh, uh, practice their art. And sometimes it's actually difficult to distinguish between these two artists. And of course, after that 1967 uh, meeting, they went their separate ways. Uh, 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 Makubela then also left South Africa in the early 70s and settled in London permanently. Uh, these are just pages from the catalogue I produced uh, in 2019. And you can see, and that was really the aim of uh, this, uh, that exhibition and uh, the ongoing uh, series, the synergy between these two artists, even between Gladys Mugutlandlu and Maggie Laubscher. This is from the 2020 exhibition and catalogue. Uh, the use of color, the use of composition, I think is quite striking in the work of uh, these two artists. They never met, although we learned from the literature that Gladys Mugudlandlu made a point of attending every single exhibition that Maggie mounted in Cape Town. Uh, Gladys, of course, lived uh, just outside uh, in, uh, in, in the townships, and you can see uh, uh, how uh, strikingly similar uh, their art is, although these two never met and they had very different entry points into uh, uh, their lives, even uh, still lives, as you can see there, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the portraits. Now, why do we do, why, why does Strauss uh, embark on uh, this series? I think first and foremost, it is to give art lovers sort of an aesthetic experience, if you like, of the museum quality uh, show. And that is why I think primarily we put it together. I think also we have a very strong educational responsibility. And in the past, I managed to work with Artist Proof Studio, for instance, uh, with other uh, art training institutions, tertiary institutions uh, in, in Gauteng mainly, and also working with institutions who might have slipped the public imagination. Uh, and I always try and make a point of including some of uh, the work in their collection uh, wherever uh, possible. And in that manner, I think Strauss and Company uh, wishes to extend and expand um, on, the, on the art ecology, I think, in, uh, in, uh, in South Africa. Now, for this particular exhibition, I drew on three very important collections. The first one uh, was uh, uh, from the Mickey and the late Mwabisa Kaya collection. Now, uh, Mwabisa sadly died just before um, uh, I, I started with this exhibition, but she was very enthusiastic about it. And she was uh, very generous in, uh, willing, in her willingness to, to lend works uh, from her own uh, private collection. And there are no fewer than eight of her fantastic work on this uh, particular exhibition. And this exhibition is really in her memory. Uh, the second big, big collection, uh, uh, I got works from uh, Robert Hodgins's private collection, of course, today in the care of Jan Mietling. Jan showed me roughly 40 extant uh, canvases 
Many of them, most of them never been exhibited or seen before. And again, I selected about eight of the works that are also on, uh, on exhibition here. And lastly, I was very fortunate to stumble across uh, the, the Pemba archive in a private collection. And the archive consists mainly of drawings in a little uh, a, a sketchbook of uh, journals, notebooks, photographs, uh, clippings, press clippings, and the likes. And you can already see um, the manner in which I, I went about the pairing, that whole idea of pairing. Look at uh, the stances, the gestures in all of these. Uh, and uh, the archive or examples from the archive will, of course, also be on uh, exhibition, especially where preparatory drawings uh, feed into final uh, paintings and uh, compositions of especially the Pemba works. Now, uh, speaking of uh, <clears throat> the pairing, of course, uh, what do these two artists have uh, in common? Why do I pair them? I think first and foremost, I looked at uh, stylistic similarities. And of course, here, uh, you will agree that they are at the opposite end of uh, a continuum of a spectrum. Uh, on the uh, left, uh, Pemba, uh, which can be uh, labeled, if you like, stylistically as a, a social realist or a regionalist. And on the right, uh, Robert Hodgins, which I think is more an, a, a, a type of an abstract uh, or an expressionist uh, ab uh, abstract artist. And uh, I use these terms because they remind me very much of uh, other artists like the American regionalists, such as you can see on the left there, an example of uh, uh, the box, uh, boxing subject matter that George Bellows was, uh, was quite fond of doing. He did a whole series of these. Uh, up to the uh, expressionist abstraction of something uh, to the likes of uh, Francis Bacon. So it was interesting to, to, to look at the style, the stylistic development of these two artists and uh, put, uh, put their work side by side. Um, also in terms of subject matter, and here you, uh, you need to use your imagination a little bit uh, to see what I have in mind here. Uh, a very uh, prosaic interior here by George Pemba. I, 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 can, I pair with a, a, a still life, if you like, by uh, Robert Hodgins. But I want to draw your attention to the tabletop here and the objects on it as compared to Robert Hodgins with a very interesting perspective here because you just see the hands of the poker player here, but the table is uh, sort of a, from a normal uh, a perspectival point of view, if you like. So it's interesting to look at this. The Pemba uh, on the one hand also giving us, apart from the very conventional uh, uh, perspective here, perspectives through the door, perspectives through the picture within a picture, uh, and perspectives through a door there. So it's interesting to look at what uh, these artists uh, offer us. Um, George Pemba, very fond of very ordinary subject matter, I like waiting at the bus stop as you can see here, or inside the train. Uh, this is his society. These are the people he depicted in, uh, in, uh, in, a, uh, in his work. Um, also uh, for entertainment, uh, George Pemba, and this is what I discovered in the archive in uh, his journals, uh, often went to Durban where he went to uh, the Zulu dances and singing um, um, concerts. And here you have spectators uh, looking at uh, such performance. And I stumbled across uh, the, the Robert Hodgins on the right hand, where you again have that lovely horizontal line dividing the picture plane with uh, the audience, with the viewers here looking at that. Uh, and his comment is, of course, uh, of a completely different uh, nature. Uh, Pemba also uh, focusing on uh, traditional African um, customs and practices and also uh, uh, the African history, as you can see here from uh, the Sangoma image on the left and the, uh, the assassination of Saka Zulu on the, on the right hand side. Um, another traditional practice, uh, and I really like this, the Pemba Hotla here. The, the council, and I paired that with uh, lovely Robert Hodgins, a difficult meeting of uh, the board, which I think is quite interesting. 
uh, that period. Now, uh, I'm going to start and I'm going to introduce Sarah Huddleston. She's, of course, the well known journalist, an independent arts writer, and also a phenomenal researcher. And uh, she, she met Pemba personally, she wrote a book about him. Uh, and Sarah, I want you to tell us about the man. Who was George Pemba? Who was George Pemba the artist? All, all yours. Um, meeting George, we bought a couple of his pictures from the Everard Reed exhibition. And then my brother was nagging me, what, you know, I was looking for a writing project and I was living in Nisen at the time. So one day I sort of um, fueled up my little red VW Golf and set off for um, Port Elizabeth. I phoned him, he said, no, it would find me to visit him. He was quite surprised to hear from, from me. And then I headed, and I've never been to Port Elizabeth before, and I got lost in the middle of Ibai, in the middle of quite a sort of turbulent time. I mean, I'd left Joburg to get away from all the riots and the necklacing, and I ended up in the middle of Ibai, and a very nice taxi driver said, where are you going? So I said, I wanted to find George Pemba. I mean, out of that huge big township, he took me right to George's door, which was quite interesting. And then um, he came and he said, would you like some tea? And I said, yes. And he said, you sure you want to have tea with me? And I, I said, why not? And he says, oh, well, you know, some people wouldn't want to have tea with me. I, he was very kind of humble and self-effacing, but actually he believed in himself hugely anyhow. So we started chatting and then we agreed that we could do the book. He showed me the quick way in and out to his house so I wouldn't have to get lost in a bayi ever again. And it was, it was the beginning of quite a few um, meetings. I recorded the stuff and I went back, back was up and down to the Eastern Cape a lot. And then I started researching, trying to find all copies of all the pictures that have been. And I have to say that um, Everard Reed himself helped me. He was so completely generous in every single way. He adored George and um, and his his whole family. They were great George fans, as was as was I. And I I it was such a great project because you know I I was born in Zimbabwe, and um, I don't know he, I knew quite a lot about South African history, but I discovered about the history of particularly the Eastern Cape. And um, anyway, we sort of got to know each other quite well. And then I go down and then. He had a huge appetite. I used to take him out to lunch. He liked fish and chips on a Friday. And, um, and they'd showed me studio and showed me the way he worked and everything like that. And eventually this book got done, but it required quite a lot of traveling. And with our, I went, um, you know, that the library at Rhodes University, I've forgotten what it's called, also had a lot of material. He gave me his diaries, his all handwritten diaries. And I don't know where they've gone. I think I loaned them to somebody and I never got them back. And um, I don't know if maybe they've been given soul to you. <laughs> I don't know. But um, wonderful recollections about, I mean, I discovered that he'd written a musical. He loved choir music. And then you're talking about his, um, you know, he loved watching performances. He loved all kind of music, choral music. Uh, mainly. And um, I just think he, he, he's an extraordinary because he started off life. I mean, his family were really quite conservative and Eurocentric in a way, but he had this great love uh, for, you know, the, the, his Cosa heritage. And um, that's why he decided at one point, he, he actually just started painting the people before life changed too much. And he actually recorded life as it was almost like I suppose some of the impressionists recorded the changing life in France from an agricultural to an industrial era. And um, there's a lot to be said about George because he, he loved the old masters and um, he, he um, yeah, he just loved them. And he, then he'd like take, a, take an idea and he translated into an African you know, context. And it worked incredibly well. And um, so I've learned a huge amount. I learned a huge amount from him. And I mean, it's probably one of the best things I think I've probably ever done. It was very traumatic because I had to find money to do it. I mean, I wasn't working. I used to do 
uh, do cocktail parties for people to earn money to pave to write. And then my brother was living in Bahrain and he would, um, he was he was a great backgammon player. He used to make a fortune, and every now and then I go to the post box, and there would be five hundred pounds <laughs> in, with a card saying "Hope it helps." And um, so it was really quite a you know quite a great experience. And then eventually James met met George, and um, there's so much stuff that's sort of in between about him. But we'll get to that when we go through the pictures. But he was a, I'd say he was a real gentleman. He loved to be smartly dressed. He always made sure that he could pay his bills, support his family, educate his children, just as his parents had done, even though he died when, his father died when he was 16. And that was a bit of a thing, but he just made sure that he studied, became a teacher so he could earn a living. Of course, he, he tossed that soon and started, a, he had a spaza shop or a, a little grocery store. And then he used to paint and have the grocery store, which his wife used to then run. So, you know, he always had his, he always liked to be respectable. He always had a car. He always, I don't know what it is. He was no different for you and than every person I know in their aspirations for a decent life. But he had this incredible creative side. I mean, he, music, art, everything he had ideas he had inspiration he had imagination and also you know during the during the struggles he used to teach the kids they they couldn't go to school because their parents had gone into exile so he used to you know they sometimes sit under a tree and he used to teach the children I mean, he was a qualified teacher and he contributed like that he also contributed a lot to the struggle by doing a lot of, I, I wish i could find some of the 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 posters that he did for the different struggle organizations and of course, later on, his grandson was caught up in the struggle. The police were always running after him. And um, it's inspired a lot of George's paintings, um, you know, about marches and, and uh, you know, the guys with the guns. There's a wonderful picture with their arm up like that, maybe like that <laughs> picture of Hodgins and, and um, Pembert. But I think because in his early life, he... He learned to draw by copying photographs in the paper. And, um, and he, that's why he got composition so right. He got expression right. I mean, I tell my daughter who's studying out now, that's what she needs to do. Just get some photographs and do the whole thing and get it right, get proportion right. You know, if somebody hasn't got um, access to really formal, um, formal art education, of course, later, he was lucky enough to be taught by amazing people, including the famous old professor, Austin Wintermore at Rhodes University. And he went and spent five months there. And really, he was extraordinary. He was helped by so many people. I mean, Professor, uh, uh, you know, Robert Shepard at Lovedale was an amazing, um, and believed in him, you know. And I think George was being born when he was born. He he believed in himself. He, he wasn't like, you know, born at the age of the beginning, say 1948, the beginning of part eight, where people were taught to think less of themselves. You know, he believed in himself and he knew he knew his own value. And I, I, I must say, I loved him dearly. I went to his funeral at the end and, um, you know, he would have been surprised because, you know, he struggled to struggle to be recognized. And believe me, at the end of it, every single government minister was there eulogizing him for, I think it went on for eight hours, the funeral, it was very exhausting. And, uh, but on the other hand, it was, it was, it was, I think he kind of would have liked, you know, the pomp and the glory. And he, of course he liked attention, you know, <laughs> well, who doesn't, I suppose, but it was a very lot, very lot of speeches from people who really didn't know him at all. <laughs> I don't know what, yeah. Um, it, it really woke, it taught me about South Africa, actually. You know, I've been living here for a very long time, but I think I really learned about the people and really he opened my eyes to a whole new world because, you know, I was still fairly insular and everything like that before I set off on my mad adventure. <laughs> no, fascinating. I'm pleased you mentioned his love for the old masters because in the archive, there are many little sketches where he copied them, you know, from Vermeer, yes. 
Rembrandt, Millet, they're all yes. there. They are most yes, charming, yes, obviously yes. copied from books, uh, art books, uh, fascinating stuff. And they were those, uh, some of those uh, sketches will, of course, be on display. Yes. Uh, you also mentioned his journals. Uh, there are some of them. I hope that it's all of them. I, I'm not too sure, but I'd love to have a look because I, I think well. we need to translate all the co the Cosa yeah. sections, yeah. and I've, yeah, I've been the... trying to get hold of them and get it done so I can do 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 something new. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, a great uh, a great uh, project. Okay, Sarah, yeah. thank you uh, uh, for all of that. Okay. Now, uh, Neil, Neil, of course, is uh, Neil Dundas is uh, senior curator at uh, the famous Goodman Gallery. I think Neil is equally famous uh, as uh, the gallery. You, of course, uh, knew him quite well. You knew him for decades. Tell us about Robert Hodgins, the man. Tell us about Robert Hodgins, the artist. Thank you very much, Phil Hallam. And, uh, and thank you uh, also to Sarah. It was really interesting hearing about that experience um, with George. I, I have to say, I think that, that Robert, in, in his absolute desire to learn something new every day of his life until literally um, until he was reading a book in hospital just days before his passing um, about art in the California school and wanting to look at new things, um, new palettes of color, different ideas to try. And I think he would have been highly entertained by this idea of pairing him with Pemba. Um, as I said to you earlier, um, Bill Helmer was quite surprised by the notion of pairing these two people. But um, it is really interesting looking at Pemba born a little earlier, Robert a little later, and of course the very reversal of roles of one being born in the colonial power, the other one here in the highly colonized and contested Eastern Cape. Um, but I think what is interesting for both of them is the circumstances from which they came and the need to really be self-driving and pull themselves together um, with using every possible educational opportunity. Um, that I was touched by the little um, sketches that Pemba was using and that determination to work with the materials and the very formal instruction that he was able to come by. Robert also, as a young child, um, did spend some time outside um, in foster homes outside of London. His mother was a single mother, um, a working girl, as, as many people would have called her, um, who I think certainly struggled, and he struggled very much with her and had a, a tense and uncomfortable relationship with his mother. Um, and made no bones of it, but equally was grateful to his great uncle who helped him get to South Africa as um, a not yet finished school. You correctly say he did get his matric while working as an insurance clerk through his uncle's intervention and bringing him to South Africa with the passage on a ship, a, a suit to wear and one banknote in his pocket. And he arrived to join his great uncle living above the harbor cafe on the waterfront in Cape Town. Something of a film noir kind of rags to riches story in lots of ways. He was a, an often shoeless child doing newspaper runs. His mother couldn't always keep him in school. And the guides at the National Gallery took pity on him as a, a little boy in cold, rainy London with no shoes and would talk to him about some of the paintings he sat and stared at for hours, by his own confession, more often to try and keep warm and get out of the rain, um, but he gradually fell in love with the notion of painting and what these grand works of art could produce in his own imagination. And so much of the rest is now history. He, um, he was able to take advantage of some opportunity working and earning not only to party a little on the rougher side of life around the waterfront, which became part of the panoply of characters he always worked with, but also eventually, of course, to go to war in the British Overseas Forces, become an intelligence officer. Um, Robert was a complex man 
with a great brain and had learned an enormous amount in his young school days despite hardship. He could quote reams of poetry. He could quote and sing along, even if badly, to a lot of opera and explain to somebody else why the opera mattered so much and why it was the music hall of its day, um, say, in Mozart, um, but also to really begin the process of understanding the human race. He was very particular about not ever talking about us and them, but rather we, not just me looking at them, but sharing his interest in the human condition, um, particularly around those people who came from less fortunate circumstances. But there he was eventually a student and graduate of Goldsmiths, which was not yet, of course, the University of London, but nonetheless, he learned in an enormous amount being able to study back in London and come back to South Africa, teaching at the Technical College in Pretoria and then working with Newscheck's magazine, uh, Newscheck magazine, um, and became eventually a senior lecturer in painting, of course, and had a, a legendary history as a great teacher at the University of Nittwaltersrand. And eventually, um, I do love the debate around the Grahamstown Festival, the then National Festival of the Arts in what is now Makanda, um, saying, well, we can't give him the Young Artist of the Year Award because actually he's almost 68. Um, and instead making him a special guest artist, and despite his sometimes adversarial friendship with Alan Crump, um, agreeing that Alan was the right critic to put together a show and make a catalogue for him, which uh, Liz Rankin, also a great art historian, managed to write for um, in, I think, an incredibly understanding way, um, acknowledging the man and his often saying things like, well, you know, I have a gym lit eye, but it has a twinkle in it, that catalogue indeed still a great piece um, and for anyone who can get their hands on it a great read um, and Rob was an incredibly generous mentor friend um, who would sometimes say no it's fine to be opinionated old boy but you should read this book before you become that opinionated on that subject um, he could be he could be critical and but gentle also um, and what I particularly liked, looking at the works with Pimba, um, I, I am a huge fan of uh, the work in the Kilbourne collection, um, A Man with a Bandaged Foot, a, a Yes, and Then Some, that understatement um, of his titling, and sometimes a comical caption belied the deep seriousness and understanding of wounded people. And I think Pember's work of social realism also had a great deal to do with the, the huge aspiration that people, particularly following after the example of Nelson Mandela, had boxing like football is a way out. It is a way to say to the world, I will succeed. I'll find another way. Um, and Robert, apart from his running around in the National Gallery as a 12 and 13 and 14 year old without shoes, also spent time in a very broken down end of London where they were living on Lupas Street. But he made the acquaintance of beggars and ex-boxers trying to help children train in the boxing gym. And he was particularly interested by what became eventually of what he called those men who had been battered just once too often, now slightly punch drunk. They understood the poor circumstances of others. They wanted to help. Um, and somebody said to him once, and I like your word stance, because somebody in a, 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 a winter school said to him, so Robert, what would be your stance on that? And he said, oh, you know, at my age, pretty much like the stance of those boxers in the gym still managing to stand, but swaying nonetheless. Um, 
all of that being said, I think you chose a really interesting group of works here because Robert was looking for social theater um, and he was trying to live up to his great book, um, which is a bound set of graphics where he says, I wish I loved the human race. I wish I loved its silly face, but more and more, I find I like the human race to draw. Um, and that, of course, was a huge part about it. He said, yes, of course, there was great hardship. There was great sorrow. There were things I saw in the war I wish I hadn't seen. There were moments of teaching and painting fitfully, but not quite getting there and finding myself frustrated, wanting to continue to teach, but also wanting to focus on my own work. And that did come to him later in life, certainly. But then there was great acclaim, um, and he found himself un sometimes uncomfortable with that as well. But his favorite place to be was processing his thoughts, his need to put things out into the world on a canvas. And he would say sometimes I must take a lot of paint and push it around on the canvas. And then I woke in the next morning and I'm quite surprised by something that's evolving there that I hadn't really thought about. But now that I could, I would find a way to make it work. And that could take me just a day or two in great energetic swiping at the canvas, or it could take me a month or two struggling and working really hard to try and find a way to make those colors vibrate next to one another, to find a way of taking that story of something rotten or amusing or both venal and comic at the same way with people who were too vainglorious, but I would find a way come what may. Um, and that is very much how I have always thought about Robert. Um, it is extraordinary to me that it can be 11 years since he died. Um, and I think that you have chosen from some of the great works that are still with Jan, a very interesting group of paintings um, that also do show a lot about that aspiring to be someone else aspiring to grow, to be the biggest and best that I can, um, that he certainly shared with George Pember. And so many of those things about performance, where Robert might show a stripper called Vive la Danse, tossing away her minuscule bra, um, Pember was looking at what those traditional museum musicians were doing, um, singing, and I love the way he writes about being aware of those bodies and wondering whether in fact you have to be African to understand that language of dance, that use of the muscles, that need for the freedom of movement. Um, I think Robert would absolutely have gotten uh, behind him in that instance. And many of his protestations, oh no, I'm not a political artist. Take a good look at Ubu and the commander in chief. Um, take a good look at Ubu and the black politician, and you know that is not true. Um, but dissembling and disguise were very much a part of what he was painting about, and certainly not wearing his heart entirely on his sleeve, but rather letting the audience go and find out about it by looking and looking again. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, you both mentioned uh, the work, so let's look at some of the works in more detail. Now, Sarah, this is one for you. Uh, this, in my mind, is the most important Pemba on the whole uh, exhibition. What are your views on this one? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's so much of the, of the period. I mean, the, the really the forced removals that I think really began with Sophia Town. Um, I don't know, because my, somebody will scream at me about this. But um, District 6 and Sophia Town, the ones that brought to mind, but it happened all over the country. And I look at this man, I mean, he's not only burdened by what he's carrying physically, he's burdened by what is happening to his life and his family. And it's incredibly poignant. So, I mean, I wish I owned this painting, actually. I think it's quite extraordinary. And it's really a, co a commentary of what, of what happened, you know, happened in people's lives over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And um, I love the way that, again, we talk about is 
they all they haven't got the same expression they all got different expressions and i mean that is very very hard because you don't see a lot of the a lot of artists can't do that every single person is got a different expression that picture you showed the, the american painter with the boxes he also has that if you look at all those all the expressions in the audience and the box are all completely different but many um so-called the township artists today they all got a bland expressions maybe they you know they're good in some way but george was extraordinary and they everyone has got a different character and i i love that about him so much yeah yeah indeed this is this is my favorite on the whole show i have to admit uh, what are your views on this one i i, I find it very George poignant spends a lot of time in waiting rooms he was absolutely obsessed with um he'd love to take laxatives <laughs> He was obsessed with his bowels, but I don't know. But generally, he was, you know, pretty good. But he must have spent lots of times in, in way, you know, in hospitals. Well, he used to go to hospitals. They probably worked then better than they work now. But um, but everybody is different. They're all chatting, you know. I I I think it's a it's a it's a lovely picture, and he did a lot of these paintings of collect people doing something collectively, like in the bus, in the train waiting at the hospital. Sometimes they look horrified because they're about to get an injection. I mean, it sort of tells the story of their lives. It looks yeah. quite neat, a neat yeah. hospital, actually. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed, yeah. yeah. And uh, and also, you know, I, I, I'm pairing this one, the waiting room, with this uh, Hodgins consulting room. Uh, Neil, what do you think of this one? <clears throat> Uh, it's 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 hard to talk to the super fan about you know what do you think of them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm hard pressed to find one I don't like. But I think that what strikes me very particularly about the Pember waiting room is, and and in fact, as um, as Sarah said about the trick work as well, they are portraits. This is not a series of archetypes, and. Robert would use archetypes sometimes, a group of people. And I think about the work in the Witz uh, Art Museum collection called Mob. Those thugs writing around a severed head that's bleeding as it gets kicked and tossed around are archetypes. They're all pretty much one and the same. And there is something about the notion of mob violence in that painting. Whereas here, um, while one would not call them social realism, certainly it is a kind of, um, an, a, it is the kind of theatre of the powerful and those who are somewhat dispossessed of their voices, maybe even those who would ordinarily be used to having a voice, but next to the doctor playing God, they don't have a voice. And that matters a great deal. And I know you spoke about a sort of red heart, but I see the doctor in front of that redness, actually. And he is standing over somebody whose tiny face is sort of very uncomfortably turned in the way that someone who is going to examine you will take charge of some physical part of your body, maybe even when you don't want them to. And that person is looking up at them at a most uncomfortable angle. The doctor very much in control, but I like these uses that Robert would often have, and I've seen Pember use too, of a horizontal line or a broken horizontal line interrupting those spaces. So the, the person in the blue chair who looks extraordinarily small and uncomfortable in a sort of oversized chair is somehow beneath that horizontal line they're a little belittled, not only by the chair, but by the space around them as well. And there are no archetypes here. There is a man with a face like thunder who comes next to the right um, and as gloomy. In fact, he appears to be surrounded by a little miasma of fog. Um, the next person along, perhaps a little more of the fog of feeling really rotten, but not quite so thunderous. But he, in his... Um, in his tie and his more formal attire would ordinarily be one of those people in a, a suit um, who would possibly be used to giving orders, but here he's not giving orders. He is sitting a little sullen and complacent 
awaiting the word of the on high. So I was most impressed on first seeing this painting, and I like it even more now. Um, and having really considered it in a different way alongside those people in the waiting room who are so much more patient um, in the Pimba. These are people here who are maybe not used to being in a waiting room and waiting very long. But if you want the doctor's word, you'll shut up and wait. Indeed, indeed. This is the one that uh, uh, you particularly liked and you asked me to include, uh, part of the Ubu cycle. <clears throat> Yes, and I think, I, is it just me, or could there be a moment of pick Puerta in that? <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the man on the left, of course, the black politician, at that time, a compromised figure, and compromised by Ubu daring to be so close and touching him. Um, one has to think about the people like Kaiser Matanzima and other leaders in parts of South Africa. Dacia Butelezi has survived it all extremely well. But the Ubus of the time were, of course, those saying, well, we're forced to sort of elide and glide towards some kind of accommodation in South Africa. But we'll pick on who we think are going to be the useful black voices. That was not a place any black politician wanted to be in. And there is a field of red among them. And it is very interesting to note that the black politicians' hands are not exuding any kind of confidence or um, physical connection in the way that the white man in his white suit is taking upon himself a role of at what confident um, closeness. It is interesting that his eyes are, and his sardonic kind of smile, belie this kind of closeness. Um, this black politician in 1983 um, was, I remember at the time, we all thought a very brave acquisition by Lorna Ferguson, then the youngest director of a, a museum in South Africa. And it certainly was controversial. There was something of the hooded gaze of the man on the left, looking back at the man on the right and saying, I know what you're up to, and you know I can't say very much. Um, but Ubu, as always, was the man playing at being very glossy on the surface, but underneath smiles and beats the heart of a villain. Absolutely. You also asked me to, to include this, uh, this image. Uh, a, a cheeky request, I thought in a way, but it is part of this 55th anniversary exhibition at Goodman Gallery at the moment. And it is of all the ceramic sculpture I know by Robert, one of my very favorite works. Um, molded and folded with that little hand. The millennials keep asking me, is that Donald Trump? Um, and I've been amused by that, but it could be because Ubu would be a very fitting character to take on the Trumpian role. Um, and here with that one slightly gimlet eye and that slash of gash of red mouth is a man, Ubu um, entrepreneur, it's, it's called here. And it very much looks at those little pinstriped men with their ties and their uniforms that Robert called the small time bastards who ruled the world, um, if you'll pardon me. But I think this all too shiny, all too pink um, entrepreneur definitely is able to dissemble. His eyes are blank. Um, and he personifies for me the way in which Robert used Jerry's Ubu, the pettiness, the spitefulness, the ability with a little power to become a little Hitler. Um, and I think Robert was an expert at it, but I see in this kind of work and in some of the ones you've chosen, that broken, defeated boxer who is not even referred to in the title, um, 
a man with a bandage. Well, yes, but a man absolutely battered to a pulp and with all around him the growing storms of a life that could become so broken that he may never get into the ring again. I think that is one of the most powerful um, of the paintings here. Um, and it is one of the most poignant of many that I remember well in Robert's output. Um, so I think there are some there are some gravely serious things raised in these all too comic apparently um, images by um, by Hodgins. And I would say the blandness of some things that are brought about in Pemba are a man determined to find the aspirational, determined to be more than what the country or the law is allowing me, learning everything, practicing those formal ways as he goes along, he is determined to show a neat, determined populace who are saying, we will be more than this and the end will come and we will be free. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. Uh, there's also uh, uh, this particular work. Now, um, just to point out, this is from the SABC collection. And next week, Thursday, uh, we are privileged to have Kula Sinisteris, the curator of the SABC collection, to talk, uh, to talk about uh, this, uh, this particular work. Um, um, Sarah, I want to go back to you. Uh, also, quite a striking, quite a phenomenal work that I have on exhibition here, a portrait of Saul Plyke's granddaughter. This is amazing. Wasn't her name Violet? Mm. Yeah, okay. So Violet's granddaughter, great-granddaughter, I know. Yeah, she lives just around the corner from me in Johannesburg. But I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated um, by this. I must tell you that um, one thing Pemba did, he, one year he attended, I don't know if he did, I think he did it more than once. Estelle Marais was really loved Pemba's work and asked him to go to the University of what was then Baputitswana. And, um, and I keep on thinking this how, but he painted this before he started going to Baputitswana. Maybe she knew him before, but this is a fantastic picture. Um, I love, I'm a complete, I think of all the South African people of history, I think Sol Plaki is my, probably the person I worship the most. I read all um, the books about him and, um, and what he did and what he was, but this really is, a, is such a portrait of complete character. I don't know who this person is behind. It looks like a, a white priest. I don't know. I, I have to say, I have never seen this picture before. And that's probably stu a terrible thing for me to admit. But, um, you know, Pemba probably painted more than 400 paintings. So I don't know them all. I know like big, big, a lot of them, but I think this is the most ex extraordinary picture of a woman of fortitude and actually, um, it's a kind. It's a woman. It's symbol. Sim, to me, it sim, sim, symbolizes the strength of women in this country in Africa. I mean, she is. You know, she's respectable. She keeps herself together, and she's very awesomely strong. I love this. I, I think this is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. 1980. 1980 was one of his. Um, I think was one of his a good period for. Um, uh, Pemba. He was also the most extraordinary portrait painter. I mean, he painted many people, but maybe this looks like not so much as a commission as a labor of love, mm. I think. Mm. Anyway, yeah. I don't know what you think, Neil. Yeah, no, absolutely. You've, you've probably got something far more erudite to say about it. <laughs> I, 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 I'm pairing this work with uh, the work on the right by Robert. Uh, and why I did was, you know, the, the idea of a picture within a picture fascinates me. Yes. Uh, and I see it very strongly here. So, Neil, you can perhaps uh, talk to us about this work. Mm. <laughs> well, I, thought, I, I think you spoke beautifully, uh, Sarah. Um, and I did wonder at who that portrait was, because it does not appear to be Paul Plackey himself. Um, 
But my gosh, his granddaughter is here portrayed with the greatest of empathy and sympathy to the subject. She is shown to be strong, but weather beaten and worn indeed. But with her glasses and with her kind of um, her beautiful royal blue um, stole around her, she certainly is a, a woman that, uh, you know, you strike the woman, you strike the rock, and that could be very mm. true of that lady. Um, the Nymph Surprised is one that has made me laugh out loud on more than one occasion. Um, <laughs> I mean, the less nymph-like one might not find a particular subject to be, but... Um, but that would be typical of Robert also then trying to show a woman maybe put upon, I suspect in this case, um, one of many who was put out um, on, on show for the students on many an occasion in Rob's life to be um, a model, a life model. And for many of those women, that life model role was less by choice than by need um, to earn something. Um, one has a feeling somehow that she has been called upon or perhaps pointed out in some way that has taken her by surprise and not necessarily with any kind of pleasure of surprise either. But I do like, again, the fact that, yes, we are looking at the picture within the picture and how much that can often um, give us um, a clue to the person. This lady, um, who is the granddaughter of Sol Plyke, has a man of the cloth, a, um, a very formal portrait there looking over her, and one wonders partly whether that is the part of the backbone of her strength, or whether it is also something that reminds her we're being watched. Um, and certainly this nymph surprised um, is almost laughably laughing at herself. One senses her discomfort, but there is something about those pictures on the wall, which may well be in the studio of people who are now painting her, which perhaps speak to some kind of aspiration of not necessarily being put on the spot this way. And yet she is comical as well. She is not exactly hanging her head. She is kind of laughing out loud. Um, and there is something of the idea that this nymph has occupied a place that is her safe place to go. She's wearing some sort of a mantle of these other figures and forms that have been painted before her as a way of dealing with the position she finds herself in. Fascinating. So, so Sarah, I may, uh, you mentioned the book. Uh, this is the cover of the book for those of you who, uh, who want to copy. Uh, you spoke about it. Anything else you want to add about uh, this project? Well, yes, uh, but I'm just, can I just talk about this picture? Mm -hmm. um, I think the picture, I think it was I always wanted to get my hands on it. It was owned by Helen Sabidi, but I think she told, sold it, which is quite sad. But it was, you know, speaks of, you know, Africans, you know, his people's aspirate, it's aspirational, you know, looking for a brighter future and everything like that. Um, there's another picture where a woman is looking out with this sunset, it was a sort of a, um, um, a, a version of a Delacroix painting that um, he did, but I must say I do love it. But this project, as I said, you know, I it 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 took a long time. Um, I had to go and beg from all the funders to get, get money to do it. But I have to say, it was it's 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 the thing of what I'm fairly proud. Apart from the fact there's a typo right on the second page, I was furious afterwards. I should have I should have read it more clearly. I did not sk skimmed over it. But these things happen. But I think that um, 
I mean, people now, years later, reading it, they 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 like it. And also, I'm very happy that I, the text inside, you know, it was very, very, well, I think it was pretty well researched. And it was teaching me something at the time about things I didn't really know about. And I and then I kept on going down, like today, I mean, we didn't have um, the internet like we had in 1996. I mean, it was very, you had, I think we had computers, um, but um, there wasn't this amazing search engines that you have today. We just go diggly glig and then find something, go down another rabbit hole. But I, I did go down a rabbit hole, but I actually went to libraries and looked in books. So that was quite something. When I tell my daughter this, she, she can't really grasp it. She's only 17. So, but um, yeah, no, very, very good. It was a perfect, perfect picture for the cover. And um, yeah. there we go. Uh, uh, thank, uh, thanks, Neil. You and Linda put together this book. Tell us about this. <clears throat> I think I've got it actually. Uh, uh, you are mute. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. Um, first, I have to protest on behalf of Brenda Atkinson, um, who, um, although she is a writer in the book and um, and certainly acknowledged uh, her, her as her role was in putting this book together. Um, we owe her a, a constant debt of apology because she was the editor on the book. Um, and I was pictures editor and I helped compile and, and put the book and its look together. Um, I, I shall really never get over the embarrassment of not having Brenda acknowledged as editor. Um, and But we had a great deal of help. Um, Brenda and I um, were indulged in it by Linda, who put up some monies, as did Estelle Dippenar um, and the Art Club um, Festival in the University of the Northwest out at Potchefstroom, and um, the festival themselves, um, as well as Tafelberg Press, com contributed to this book. Um, and Robert and Jan Nietlin, um in, in himself, finding old photographs, finding um, details from the past and putting together a series of um, lists of people to go to and borrow really helped put together this retrospective exhibition, which premiered at the Art Club Festival um, in that year and then traveled to other places and those other places included museums and university museums and the Sassel Museum and um, UNISA in particular as well and WITS, um, where people then brought further works from long before, um, private lenders came forward and, um, and added to the exhibition, which grew in strength and character by means of those things. And so we were greatly aided in that process. Um, and it was about 10 months in putting together the work, not only out of Robert's archive, but out of the archives and holdings of various um, bodies who later hosted that touring exhibition. Um, and of course, the, we had a very big space at the Art Club Festival and were able to build on that. This cover picture um, has always been one I have dearly loved. It remains in a very top-notch private collection. Um, and there were others that one became more aware of because they had come in and out of the gallery, as things often did in Robert's uh, heyday at that time, where we would sometimes have people waiting outside the closed doors of the preview with their own little stash of red stickers to come inside and put a sticker on and, and a label and stand next to it and say, no, no, bring me one of the staff. No one else is allowed to look at this. I've not. Um, as Robert said once, um, I was delighted by the scrum at my opening tonight, old boy. Um, never did I dream that my work was going to be so in demand that people would be 
you know, sensible northern suburbs matrons in twin sets and pearls were seen elbowing each other aside to get to the the, the <laughs> level and hold their stick in there. Um, equally, he, as all complex people, and and as Robert could always say, yes, I would be the one with the great tale to tell and the joke. There was always um, a shaded place behind that raconteur, um, remembering from where these kinds of ideas had come and the sort of people who, in their vainglory, in their foibles, in their bitterness and anger, could be the ones who would colour the panoply of um, delightful characters, but often venal characters that he took joy in painting. Um, so the process of putting the book together was a, a, a privilege of working um, in Jan's dining room um, and with more than one or two of us at any one time. We had sort of <laughs> round table sessions with people like Sarah Ballam um, and her brother photographing for uh, and taking on more of the photography from Jan. Um, and people who had worked with Robert in the Vitz department um, or on his sojourns as a, 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 an external lecturer and ex examiner at other parts of the country. Um, it was a great journey and a great re-exploration of his work that I had been dealing with pretty much since 1983 and four onwards, but particularly from 1986 onwards. Um, but when one learned it was a good idea to re-evaluate everything while we were going through that um, process of commissioning the writers, but listening to people like Catherine Smith and Kendall Gears and Brenda Atkinson, and particularly Ray DeBecca, who really knew Robert well, having as she said, um, sheltered him in my uh, garden, cottage and studio during the years when he was at his zenith academically. And while he was most carefully releasing his work only when he felt that there was a good cause for the exhibition to be seen in the context of what was continuing to go on in both academics and politics and personalities uh, lives at the time. So, so this was 2002, if I'm not mistaken, and recently uh, you contributed to this, uh, this catalogue, Satire and Irony. This was 2019 at the Belchemy and in Cape Town. And what a, that was a great occasion to see two big and earnestly put together collections like that of the Bloch um, and Kilbourne families who have done Robert Proud, I think, in assembling astonishing groups of works. I thought this was a really marvelous exhibition and it, the night of the awards, like the, um, the Sistine, that work out of the SABC collection and this from um, the show at Melchemiant, of course, are enormous works, multiples of large canvas, um, but they do owe a great deal to that examination of art history from Robert. Um, that ability to paint and push paint around and rework and relayer those surfaces and drawing into what had already been painted or obscuring some part of what had already been painted is a very large part of what made Robert um, a great colorist, a great painter, um, but also a great exponent of social history of the time. Um, then those figures from the Sistine are not just descended little characters out of those paintings of Michelangelo Buonarroti, but they are also very much about the popes who were sitting in office at the time. So we see that crimson, we see those little skull caps on the back of them. And there is something of those 
the rather shady popes who were running those vast fortunes at the time and who gave rise to the fact that the Sistine Chapel could even be built. And here, the night of the awards, um, as Robert said, I'd always disdained the idea of awards. And then one or two came my way and I thought, hmm, just how disdainful are you being now? Um, so something of that pinstripe person is there. Something of that face that is also partly a skull behind it. Something of that person, half not there. The hollow men. And as he said, yes, very often we would be listening and paying obeisance at a night of awards being made to people whose worthiness we might doubt or might trouble us later. But everybody had to play the game. Um, and so the appearance is very much in the way of the George Dyer part in Bacon, all those popes in Bacon, who, if you look a little behind them and you dig, are seriously found wanting, as are so many of those accoladed with power in our societies. Indeed. Uh, now, um, uh, a final assessment, and I'm including this because the title of the exhibition is Social Stances, and just like these two artists, <coughs> Pemba and Hodgins, then took up certain attitudes, certain stances towards the society. Society also, in turn, uh, had certain views about them, and these are a couple of the ones that I could identify in the literature. And I was wondering, um, uh, uh, Sarah, if you could talk to some of them, you know, of George Pemba, people said he was the grand old master of township art. He was the Norman Rockwell of South Africa. Uh, what a Goya, that is an exclamation by Joan Wright. She was the daughter of Dorothy Kay. She mentioned that after an exhibition in the early 1960s at the Eastern Cape Society of Arts. Uh, Millayesque, obviously referring to uh, Jean-Francois uh, uh, Millay, the uh, early 19th century artist. Uh, Hogarth among South African black artists and also part of the Eastern Cape colonial vision, you know, the, the type of uh, cross-up portrait often painted by uh, Barbara Tyrrell and even Dorothy yes. Kay. Uh, what are your views on uh, some of these labels? Well, um, I'd like to say one little thing first is that, which I should have said before, is that my book wouldn't have gone been done without the help of Hayden Proud from the South African National Gallery. He guided me in the right direction. I helped him find pictures for his big exhibition, which was pretty much at the same time. But, um, you know, we, we have talked about a few of these things. But um, Grand Old Master of Township Art, I think that's what Estelle Murray uh, described him as. And um, I think that she's not wrong. I mean, he emulated the great masters, but he, I don't think, what we recognize as township art. I mean, he's far elevated to that sort of uh, level. Um, I think maybe I think that because I'm a white person used to, you know, it's a, he, had, he had a classical education. Um, not that there are many fabulous township artists that came after him, but um, he was very, he was very measured and determined in the way that he painted and planned his pictures. The planning of his pictures, as you can see from his diaries, I mean, he writes about you no know, dark light, color, this stuff, the next thing. So I think, you know, he pretty much has, you know, he's earned that epithet. Now the Norman Rockwell um, thing, that was from Ivor Powell. And I was so irritated about it at the time because I think it was, it might've been in, um, in a, when he reviewed my book and he talked about blah, blah, blah. So, but also what I was irritated at the time, well, let's talk about the Rockwell um, aspect first, is that uh, to me, Norman Rockwell is like this perfect happy life, you know, in American society, you know, mother goose and apple pie and, you know, everything's perfect. Well, George 
he was he was a social realist as well i suppose that's the the link but that's really where it stops whereas george went the other side he painted a lot of pain <laughs> he painted a, a lot of pain which actually i mean i can't i could i don't know who was it said what a goya do you do you know uh, yeah, that was uh, Joan Wright. She was the daughter oh, yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. Kay, and that was after an exhibition in the early 1960s that George, uh, George uh, contributed to uh, of yes. the Eastern Cape uh, Art Society. Yes, oh. of course, George had known uh, Dorothy Kay for a very long time because um, he, uh, she invited him, she saw one of his exhibitions, she said, please come and paint. She joined, he joined her painting circle. And they, she said the first um, day, they, they said, okay, they got to paint a reflection in a mirror. But George painted this amazing pic uh, of, of a broken bit of mirror and somebody doing their, combing their hair in a broken bit of mirror, as you might find in a very poor shack or something like that. And they were so entranced. They could have such a unique perspective on something which, you know, somebody might have done in a perfectly straightforward manner. So that was the but. So, um, yeah, so, as, you know, uh, I mean, Goya and Pemba had a lot in common. I think Pemba admired Goya a lot because, um, paint, you know, he, he, Goya's painting reflected contemporary historical sort of upheaval. And that's exactly where George kind of positioned himself for a lot of his work. And I mean, he really was, it was a social commentary of all the ups and downs in this country. I mean, there were some very happy pictures, but they're also not such happy pictures. And, um, and I think his strong use of color and movement and expression and everything like that. So I think she was, she was spot on. Um, when you come to the bit about, you know, but like Mille, Mille, I mean, he used to, as I said, I think I mentioned earlier, I mean, Mille's picture, he, the, one of the pictures here where they're gathering corn or something like that in, in my book um, was really after uh, one of Mille's pictures, the gleaners, you know, um, harvesting corn, uh, well, it was wheat, I suppose, by, by hand, um, you know, in the, in the, uh, the late 19th century. And um, I just think it's really lovely that he he made such a big study of the great masters. Every yeah, I think and Dorothy Kay used to had a huge selection of books, which were a great um, a, gr a great um, sort of inspiration for Pemba to paint something in a different context. Um, some of the paintings I, I I once had a painting. Sadly, I had to sell it because you know writers are very poor. <laughs> but it was called uh, uh, in in the book. It's down as arrest police and slaves, mm -hmm. and a very sort of a uh, uh, goyerisque thing. But actually, it has Steve Biko's face in it, mm -hmm. so it's actually a was the arrest of Steve Biko. But I only found out after the book was published. That was quite sad. So, mm -hmm. and then the Hogarth uh, reference among Blake's, he did. He painted things in the nitty gritty the worst people in the highest emotions. And um, we had some hot, some hard, uh, Ogarth, not paintings, but um, engravings where, where I grew up. And I know exactly what they mean like that, because you can see the smallest little detail of something that's going on in that household. And um, I think that is, you know, it is fairly apt. I don't know who, who said that, do you, do you know who's, I don't know who said it. Yeah, I think that was also Hayden Proud in his catalogue. Oh, right, okay. Well, I think he's, it, it, it's, it's, you know, he's also spot on. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about his work being part of the Eastern Cape colonial vision, um, are you talking mainly about his paintings of people in tribal, in natural tribal dress? Yeah, yeah. well, those paintings actually were done in Lesotho and um, around the country actually, but he did this in his grand tour. He, that's what he did. He wanted to record those people um, while they were still like that, before the, they changed and they became too 
westernized and became too urbanized and everything like that. But apparently what was so interesting is that when he was up in Lesotho in about 1941, 1942, he's on his, what I called the grand tour. And uh, cause that's exactly what he wanted to do. Um, he, he ended up in some mission station in the hill, hills, but the, the priest there had collected all these tribal knickknacks and jewelry and costumes and it, well, they weren't costumes, they were their dress. And then he actually dressed those people in those, they, did, they weren't theirs, but he made them appear that way, which I think is quite, uh, quite, quite wonderful. And um, there's, and I, I, I thought the watercolors, um, you've seen some of the watercolors of that time, and I must say they are pretty fantastic. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and then also, um, he, he, he did wonderful mythical things, you know, like the slaughter of the, the Kosa people in the Nongouza. I think they, non, the Nongouza pictures. Mm -hmm. um, he did a whole series of those because that was like, very, um, very close to close to his heart. He, yeah. he loved um, cause cause of tradition, cause of history, cause of myth, and all of that. And so I think we're very, very. He's got a wonderful portrait about um, was a famous in Kai, who was a famous praise singer, who even performed at Heel Town when Nelson Mandela was there and recited this most incredible poem which i'm sure you've read because it's in my book mm. i just think george was he was pretty extraordinary so mm. i would say if anyone can ever has enough money to buy a pemba buy one <laughs> it's a right. pity it's a pity um one of those pictures that's on this exhibition the kotler painting you talk about was actually bought by the person who bought it who's loaned it to you um he was teaching up at Baputatswana University and George had attended an exhibition. And for some reason, he didn't have enough money to get back to Kimberley where his lift was leaving from. So he sold it to my friend for like 450 Rand. <laughs> so which is, a, I'm sure one day if he wants to sell it, he'll get a very good return on it. But yeah. in those days you could pick, it was sad. You could pick, that was about 500 Rand. You could buy really good Pemba. I mean, I, I think when I discovered him right early, early on, I think about four and a half thousand rand was more the price mm. that you would pay mm. for a pen, but now they go for 400,000 rand in some Indeed. cases. Yeah. So Indeed. I'm just sorry that he was not, not around a bit longer to, you know, reap the rewards, but that's the case so often with artists. Dead artists are richer than live ones. Mm. Well, they yeah. would have been anyway. Yeah. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, Neil, there are a couple of uh, uh, things about Robert Hodgins, if you care to comment on some of them. Uh, yeah, well, of course, some of them were, are, are very much from our book and Undiscovered at 82, um, Kendall's opinion, um, which I think he still holds to, was that the, the world at large still has to discover Hodgins. Um, he had come to great fame in South Africa by, um, by the 90s was, um, in Rob's own view, um, enjoying all, all the benefits of, of fame and fortune. But, um, but certainly um, there have been moments when we have felt that perhaps something like the Tate Britain would be um, a, a valid aspiration that there might be the possibility of a, of a larger show going to one of these major um, international museums. And that part has yet to come. Um, and many of us, um, and William, you have made exhibitions and worked closely with Robert. Um, he had the, the absolutely undisguised admiration of his fellows and peers um, here in South Africa and people like William Kentridge and Deborah Bell working with him and working together with him. We're showing Memo in the gallery at the moment with Rob in his suit being directed um, by William um, in real life but with cartoon animation around him drawn by himself and William and Deborah and it is a masterwork of, of animated film. Um, 
And sometimes I wonder why on earth it still has been so long without being discovered by other major entities around the world. And then Rob would point out to me before he died, well, you know, I do have works in MoMA. They might be in the print and multiple collection, but still they're in MoMA. Um, and this is true. And there are some wonderful collections of works in some major museums around the world. But I do understand um, uh, either power, uh, I mean, partly quoting Robert himself, an artist working at the fag end of the millennium, somehow about that fin de siècle way of thinking, this way of having looked so much in Rob's eyes as a youngster at the end of the 19th into the 20th century. And um, I do again bring us back to that tattered boxer sitting there bandaged and how much it relates to the beast slouches in the Witz collection, um, which I still think is one of Robert's greatest paintings ever, and is of course about the collapse of the old imperial order and the, the sort of staggering um, effect of the world wars on the great European powers who maybe were no longer so great, and, and what that would mean for a world reinventing itself. Well, um, the best thing would have been for Robert to live to be 120 and continue to be the greatest colorist because I think he used those colors of bruises and colors of wounds and, um, and colors of the palest and subtlest of um, washes of pink or pale yellow and blue against a backdrop of great violence and great horror. Um, but he made those things work. And in the same kind of way, we have seen it work in pictures like the lady painter in her studio, um, or play softly while I sing my song um, about a, um, a no longer so great opera singer standing in her nervousness on a stage. Um, and we have seen those kinds of pale color, all the very vibrant and screeching kind of yellow and orange and pink and chaparelli pink against an, a, a citrus orange can be said to vibrate with a harshness in the soundscape of the of the universe, but he did make them work. Um, made in Africa, of course, the question mark came and the question came out of himself in conversation with Rada Becker. Um, and she looks very much at what he was able to borrow against. And he would say, not an African painter, but of course he was a painter who had lived long in Africa and had made parts of those African debates a part of his own work. So again, a little bit like saying, I'm not a political artist, and then commenting very cynically on the politics of the time. Um, I think he may not have been made in Africa, that he made a life in Africa. But the extended conceit of sorts, a pig on which to hang historical and experimental cross-references, well, yes, um, Robert was a genius at actually looking at ways of saying, yes, I am not going to be bound by this is not my single theme. This is not my central and only conceit, but I am going to find a way of using all these influences around me over and over again, and in some way using them in something that will become my own way of reinterpretation, my way of finding the best that I can out of what we have seen go before, but acknowledging always we all steal and borrow consciously or up, those of us observing from inside our brain maybe even unconsciously, are reusing um, and reinterpreting. But there is something good in the process of a homage um, or a reusing, or perhaps, dare we say, an improvement on something we saw once before. Many artists do it. Robert took joy in being able to say, of course, I steal from Picasso and Batis, but I only do it to make them look better. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Thank you, Neil. Uh, we we have really come to the end of this. Uh, thanks both of you very much for uh, most entertaining, most insightful, uh, most informative uh, comments on uh, on these two artists and uh, their pairing. And perhaps just to end that, uh, if you want to uh, know more, go to our website, starsart.co.za. We are in the process of constructing a virtual 3D gallery that will also be released on our website. Uh, we are in the time of uh, level four COVID. Of course, people can't visit the exhibition. We hope after the 14th of July, we'll come down to level three and then people by appointment can come and see the uh, exhibition. Uh, there's, you will also find the program of events there. Uh, next Friday, for example, I'm doing a workshop for our teachers those of you interested in that uh, and then of course the e-catalog at the moment that is available on that link you can also find it on our on our website okay uh, we are way over time but i think it was worth every second thank you so much uh, sarah thank you so much anil for your thank wonderful you. wonderful contributions thank you thank you very much to you and to strauss for hosting this yeah Thank you.